Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of CMI's The Leading Issue. Today, my guest has such a long list of accolades. She's one of the best and most recognized leaders in the UK. I'm talking, of course, about uh, Karen Blackett OBE. She's the president of WPP in the UK. She's made the list of Britain's most influential black people many times. She's a non-executive director of Diageo, the cre creator of many award-winning uh, apprenticeship programs and um, an incredibly accomplished person. So welcome, Karen, please join me today. Hi, and it is lovely to see you and thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. Well, let's get started. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you become this um, top leader of the advertising world and communications world? Um, and what were some of the challenges you faced along the way? So, look, I studied a geography degree in the at the University of Portsmouth, where I'm proud to be chancellor of. So I didn't mm -hmm. study anything that was connected to the advertising industry at all. Um, but I'd always been fascinated by adverts as much as I had the actual programme. So whether that was on TV or whether that was on radio, I would sit there and think I could come up with better ideas, but I knew nothing about the industry. I, 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 was, I didn't have anyone that was connected to the industry. I'm a second generation Barbadian in the UK and with most Barbadians who are first generation or West Indians, they want you to have a profession. So to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. And I clearly wanted none of those things for myself. So I sort of started researching the industry how do I get in what's the areas of it I didn't know at the time that there was a difference between an ad agency or a media agency and so I just started researching and I got rejection after rejection after rejection trying to get into the industry and so I I did a little bit of a lateral move in order to get in part of my degree we'd done a statistics module so I sort of answered an ad to be a media auditor. So mm -hmm. to use the stat side of my um, degree. And I went in for an interview. I was asked back for a second interview. I had to present. And it was at that second interview, they thought that I might be better at planning or buying. So they sent me to a different part of the company, which at the time, the auditing part and the media buying and planning part were together. Um, and that's how I got my foot in the door. But I had several rejections, agency side and client side, because I hadn't gone to the right university. I hadn't studied the right thing. And uh, I was, I suppose, a bit of a misfit or different to what was already in the industry. So it was persistence and resilience that got me in. And then once I was in, I was then able to you know, do lots of lateral moves in order to find out about the industry and find out what I was I was good at. So it was hard because there weren't many people that looked like me in the industry mm -hmm. when I started. Um, well, that's um, uh, certainly not something that I'm sure is the, was the case. And that persistence and resilience is a theme that we'll come back to. But I know you've just returned from Cannes and um, it was bigger than and better than ever. <coughs> But what what tell us what are the common myths about the media and advertising industry from your many years of experience in many different areas that you'd really like to bust? Do you know what? I, I think because the, the thing about the industry and the advertising industry is that it is constantly evolving. It is constantly evolving and I think people genuinely think that you have to be really good at drawing um, <laughs> to be in the industry. And it's not the case at all. It is, and I'm going to do a bit of a catch all for the creative industries as a whole, but the, the creative industry is the third largest employer of people with STEM degrees. And you wouldn't think that. Wow. So the, advertising industry it really is whole brained it is left brain and right brain 
in order to really look at how you grow brands and how you deliver growth for a client. So it, I, I would like to say that we can really add to market share. We can really add to share price. And I think that's the bit that's always underestimated or undervalued. Yeah, so it's not about the fluffy stuff or the pretty pictures. It's about, um, you know, delivering hard and fast right. business results and absolutely growth. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely. Because if we don't deliver growth, if we don't help add, you know, market share or add share price, then we're not going to be in business very long. So that, that accountability and the fact that it's left and right brain, so whole brain, I think is the bit that is often underestimated with our industry. Yeah, and do you think, just quickly adding on to that, do you think that the um, <clears throat> the leaders and CEOs and chairs across the, the top companies in the UK understand that? Or do you think there's still some of this notion that, you know, uh, for example, we we often say there aren't very many marketers um, sat around board tables. It's a really good question, Anne, because I do think where I have had experience of CEOs who had previously been CMOs, um, you absolutely see how the ad agency or the media agency is really brought into those top meetings. Um so, you know, I, I could talk about Dave Lewis at Tesco. I could talk about Stephen Van Ruen at Sky, where they've had sort of a brand or marketing background and they become the CEO. They get the value of brands. They get the importance of how it can add and grow an organisation. But I have to say our conversations are at CMO level. I do think we're having more conversations with chief technical officers as well, just because of how much the industry has evolved in terms of looking at data and digital and AI. So what we do isn't just communications. It is as much about marketing technology. It's as much about commerce. It's as much about customer experience. So mm -hmm. I'd say our points into a board vary from our marketing contacts through to CTOs and CEOs now. Yeah, and I want to uh, build on that technology point you made. Um, obviously, as technology advances, big data becomes huge. Um, how do you think that, that that's going to um, evolve, to use your word, the, the um, um, creative industry? And how can the wider, wider business world leverage um, the advantages and opportunities presented by data, technology, um, AI responsibly and ethically? So look, I, I think the core thing when we look at any innovation or advancement when it comes to technology and data and AI, we have to have a real focus on what's the objective, what's the intent, which I think is really, really important, but what's the consequence and risk as well? Mm -hmm. Because we have seen, you know, through the pandemic, that customers or consumers are willing to share data if they feel that there's an equitable return and that they feel as though they, you are using that data responsibly to create better advertising experiences. And I think that's so important that we can find out more about our customers, we can tailor things to create a better advertising experience but you always have to make sure that you are clear about your objectives, that your intent is good, and that you know what the possible consequences or risks are. And I think as long as you have that frame, framework and you constantly review it, because it's not a static thing, I think you're good. But I think it's really important that you are transparent and open and that you have as a board, or as a group of people creating advertising or creating communications, that you constantly review your ethics and your data ethics. And, you know, Group M created a data ethics compass to make mm -hmm. sure that you have those guardrails. And I think it's really important that that's constantly reviewed. Well, um, that's a really uh, vital, obviously, uh, tool and consideration, how to keep data ethical. 
But we know from a survey CMI just did on artificial intelligence that the vast majority of managers are actually uh, afraid that AI is out to get their jobs. So uh, how do you deal with that? Um, and of course, in content industries, I suppose that fear is also present. So, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you encourage people to embrace these tools without being afraid of them? it's it's such a because look I've heard that conversation a lot and I always go back to you know you know back in the in the early 60s when we had big computers coming in everybody thought that the working day was going to be cut by four hours and we'd be doing four hour working days or when you know we had the invention of the smartphone it was going to do things which made things quicker and easier and again that would be more time efficient I don't know anyone who uses a laptop and a mobile is working less or has been replaced. So, and I feel the same for AI. I think it has to be viewed as something that can enhance what we do mm -hmm. rather than taking our jobs away. It can take away some of the tasks which allows us to then focus on other things. So I'm really clear about task automation and how we use AI for task automation. I'm really clear about helping us with content generation. And I think that can be a brilliant thing. And at Khan, I saw some brilliant examples and winners of where AI has been used to enhance our creativity. We can use it for insight extraction to do things quicker. So I think mm -hmm. that's really important, but also decision making as well. So looking at those decision trees and using AI to help us with those decision trees. So I understand why people may be fearful, but I think if you're talented and I think we use AI in the right way, it can free up those brains of humans to actually focus on areas which can enhance what we do rather than take away roles and jobs. Yeah, I completely agree. So it's about augmenting human judgment, not replacing it, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, OK, moving to the 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 more human parts of business um, in the UK and the wider business world. Um, what do you think is um, the role of, of business and its responsibility for the more societal uh, challenges we face, whether that's equity, diversity and inclusion or sustainability? Um, how do you believe business leaders uh, should uh, tackle these issues? broader issues? Look, I, I think the, the, the key thing is to focus on what consumers or customers want. And consumers and customers expect businesses to take a broader role in society. Um, I was looking at some data recently about trust and uh, looking at who consumers trust and looking at how the advertising industry compares to other industries. And you know, trust in our government, um, trust in organisations that have a high standing in society is waned and they are expecting businesses to step in. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a stat, especially for the Gen Z generation, that 84% of consumers expect businesses to play a role in creating a fairer society. So I think it and I don't see that making a profit and doing good are two separate things. They are linked. So it's not a choice. And I don't think it's something that you should be afraid of. Of course, we're all in business to make a profit, but we shouldn't only be in business to make a profit. And it's what our customers want. They want us to have a role and they want us to, you know, try and help create that fairer society and really try and help really have a role in terms of how we sustain our planet. So we, what we need to ensure, though, is that we have the right people in the room when we are looking at what that role is and how it's executed. And I think there have been some recent examples of where we've not had the right people in the room um, mm. and there has been a backlash and it's not been authentic either. So some examples from the US where we've seen, um, you know, some beer brands yep. coming out with a possible position and it having a massive backlash in the US and then course correcting and going to the other extreme. 
So I, I really think it, it's about authenticity and having the right people in the room to make sure you make the right decisions. And you get somebody like Nike, who, when they do get backlash, it's this is who we are. This is yeah. what we believe and sticking to what their purpose is. And I think that's that's what is key. You are authentic. You have a key purpose, which is at your core and you don't flip flap. You don't change according to people that, you know, disagree or people that agree. You stick to your guns and you make sure that you stand up for what you believe in whilst also making a profit. Yeah, no, it's a really important point. At CMI, we, we have discovered in response to many of these issues what we call the say-do gap. So lots of organizations saying, for example, that they're inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. They embrace whatever it is, ethnicity or disability or age. But then you ask them, so what are you doing? And um, the answer really is not much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's so what you're saying is a black square on Instagram to show yeah. that you're uh, focused on racial equity. Yeah, exactly. Or just you know, let me just replace my logo with the pride colors, and you know, yeah. all of this. And so you, what you're saying is it has to go beyond that. You know, you have Absolutely. to be authentic and consistent. Yeah, and do things that back your belief. Yeah, and and look, you may well get backlash by some proportions of society you may well do but if it's what you believe in and it's what your core values are then you don't you don't do an about turn and go to the other extreme yeah well we touched on this in my opening question but um in your view what are some of the most important personality traits or strengths um that that have gotten you or somebody as successful as you in your industry to where you are now look I think you have to have a love for what you do and I love I absolutely love brands I am a brand person I love growing brands I love creating brands I love launching brands so I think you have a, have a real love of an understanding of what a brand is I also think you've got to have a real curiosity about people mm -hmm. because the best advertising campaigns is when you can match an authentic consumer insight to a brand insight. Those are the best campaigns where you can find that whisper in all the noise that connects you with a consumer. Mm -hmm. So I think that real love of people and understanding of people and understanding of consumers and a fascination and curiosity with how people change and evolve and think and behaviours, I think is really important. You absolutely need to have a mathematical mind as well, which is why I was saying at the beginning, it's about whole brain mm -hmm. because you absolutely need to understand how to talk to shareholders. You need to understand how to talk about net sales, profit margin, EBITDA, you, cash flow. You have to have a mathematical mind. Mm -hmm. You really do in order to be able to work out the right strategy. And then, look, I have quite a thick skin. So <laughs> persistence and resilience is really important because whether it's rejection for you as an individual for a role whether it's rejection for an idea that you've crafted and spent time on you absolutely need to be able to listen so I always talk about two ears one mouth and using mm. them in that proportion so listen but also be able to really you know every setback you have a major comeback is what I always say so when there's a setback there'll be a major comeback and not mm -hmm. take it personally yeah, and you're always learning, that curiosity. Yeah. Um, so turning to culture for a moment, uh, culture in companies and organizations has been a lot in the headlines, not always for the right reasons. Um, tell us, <laughs> tell us in, you know, for you, how important is culture and what does good culture look like? Look, I think the reason why I have been at WPP in various agencies and in various roles for the time that I have is because I adore the culture. I think the reason why 
I became a Ned for Diageo is because I adore the culture. Culture is incredibly important to me. And it's one where I, I genuinely find that I am attracted to cultures where their diversity is celebrated, that you're, you know, I've worked in organisations that try and turn you into a clone, mm -hmm. that you all become the same sort of thing. And that difference isn't celebrated and where people can grow. I yeah. think it's so important where people can grow and where, you know, people have got different job titles, but hierarchy doesn't mean that somebody who's, you know, at a grassroots level can't talk to somebody who's a leader in a business. And I, again, have worked with organisations where that hierarchy persists and as though the only people that can have good ideas are the people leading an organisation. So culture is incredibly important. It is incredibly important. It's set from the top, but it has to permeate all the way through an organisation. So the CEO absolutely is critical to a company culture, but it has to come from all areas. It has to be embedded everywhere. Um, and I think that's, you know, a healthy culture is an organization that thrives. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and one of the things that you mentioned, it has to be throughout the organization. And obviously CMI, we um, we say our mission is to take accidental, accidental managers and turn them into conscious leaders. Um, a lot of organizations promote on the basis of technical competence, mm. um, functional capability, but then they don't actually train their people in values, in behaviors, in yeah. how to lead and manage. Um, and often that leads to trouble. Uh, what do you think about that? Should, should, should we be investing more in that as businesses? I... 100% wholeheartedly agree because you get promoted because you're good at a job, you're good at a technical skill set, or you're good at a particular role. But when you move up an organization, you start leading people, not just managing people, but leading people. And I hate the, I really hate the phrase soft skills yeah. because it makes it sound as though it's less important. But those skill sets, and I think those are, you know, 21st century skills, which means that people will follow, which means that people will turn up and do their best, which means that people will thrive, I think are undervalued. And I, I really agree that, you know, more attention and focus should be, fo should be placed on leadership skills, not just techni technical skills. And the most mm. undervalued skill, which I think can cripple an organisation, is conflict management. Mm -hmm. When people, and I think healthy tension is good, yeah. when people disagree, being able to manage that conflict, not avoid it. I've, I've Too often I see avoidance of conflict and the big issues, and it cripples an organisation. So I 100% wholeheartedly agree about those skills which are needed. And it's not soft skills, but those skills yeah. that are needed in order to lead um, are, un are totally undervalued and are absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I, I also agree with what you said about conflict management. And that's part of it, isn't it, is being able to manage a, an atmosphere where people can disagree constructively and get to a better place right and not avoid it and 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 there is quite a lot of um um you know unintended conflict avoidance and it never goes well i completely agree it with that doesn't. It, it paralyzes an organization or it allows people to behave in a way that isn't right you, yes. there should be a consistent way for people to behave and not exceptions to the rule yeah no, I, that's very true um, so, okay, we talked about some of your early knocking on doors and rejections. Um, as a leader, how have you coped from fail with failure? And, and what have you learned from failing? I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about, you, you sort of asked, what have I learned from failures? Mm -hmm. And I think learning 
is the key thing for and, and a, a mantra that I say to my team, a mantra that I say to my son is minor setback, major comeback, because you learn from it. You learn. And I think feedback is a gift and you get better. So for me, when things go wrong or when there is some form of failure, of course, I'm upset by it. Of course, I take a moment and I beat myself up about it. But then I take that moment. What have I learned? What could I do better? How can I improve? Because that makes you more viable, more resilient. It makes you hungry for the next opportunity because you want to do it right the next time. So look, I, I think everybody in their career have had things that have not gone right, whether those are big or little. Every career has failures every single day, little failures every day, little setbacks every day. It's how you take that as a learning opportunity and how you make sure that you improve going forward. None of us are a finished article. We're all learning every day. And those failures help enhance that learning. Yeah. And it goes back to your opening remark about that curiosity and, you know, that persistence and taking that forward. Um, well, we're getting to our last question. This has been an absolutely stellar conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but if you were in charge, you know, of the whole of the whole shebang, let's say the UK, um, not just WPP, but the whole UK. Um, what would be your one leading issue that you would take on and direct efforts and society to resolve if you were the boss? So I am a founding trustee for a charity called the Black Equity Organization. And I'm a founding trustee alongside Dame Vivian Hunt, uh, David Lammy, Kwame Kwayama. And we came together post the murder of George Floyd. And we sort of worked on the organization for two years before we launched. And that was about looking at systemic and structural issues which stop black people in the UK from fulfilling their full potential. And so if I was in charge of the whole of the UK, I would look at that on a wider basis, not just about race, about what stops talent from fulfilling their true potential, because some of it's structural, some of it's systemic, uh, the brilliant CEO of Creative UK, Caroline Norbury, talks about talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. So when we have a workforce which essentially can unleash its full potential and you get that equity of opportunity, that is good for UK productivity, that is good for UK society, it is good for us on the world stage. So I would focus on equity of opportunity and really try and grow brand Britain. I think that's really important. That's amazing. And that, that fits beautifully with um, CMI's 75th anniversary project, which it is our 75th year, which is the everyone economy. I happen to have the report here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and the there everyone economy is doing exactly what you are um, advocating, which we're looking, how do we get equality of opportunity, you know, for all of these people to unleash the full potential of all that, that talent, whether it's disabled, black, old, Absolutely. gay, female, whatever it is uh, from, a, from a disadvantaged background, because that will unleash growth and prosperity and build brand Britain. So um, Karen Blackett, we want you running the show. We agree with you. <laughs> Never going to happen. <laughs> okay. Well, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, thank you so much for participating in this edition of The Leading Issue. And uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me, Anne. And I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Great.